Okay, we're going to get started again. Welcome to the uh, last scientific uh, session of the day. This is the cardiovascular imaging session. Um, it's now my uh, great pleasure to introduce Professor Debbie Al Lee, who is visiting us from Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, where he's the inaugural director of the Biomedical Imaging Research Institute, and he's also professor of medicine and bioengineering at UCLA. Uh, before that, he studied at uh, the University of Virginia and was professor of radiology at Washington University in St. Louis and Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, he served the imaging community as president of the ISMRN. He's a former board of trustees member of the SCMR and is an associate editor of MRM and JMRI, as well as being a fellow of the ISMRM and the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. Uh, we're delighted uh, that he has also decided to invest in PET-MR technology and that we are now enjoying a collaboration with him and his group at CEDARS and its applications in cardiovascular disease. Professor Lee is a leader in the field of coronary artery imaging, atherosclerosis imaging, myocardial blood flow imaging, and non-contrast MR angiography. And, and I'm very happy to say that I'm one of the beneficiaries of his work as one of the sequences I run every day is based on uh, work in one of his many important contributions in scientific literature. So uh, we're delighted to have Debbie Al talk today. Uh, his talk is MR coronary angiography and vessel wall imaging. Well, thank you, Phil, for the nice introduction, and uh, uh, thank Dr. for the for the invitation to really attend this uh, very well-known symposium now in the sixth year, and uh, I've known Dr. for many years, and I moved to uh, LA about five and six years ago. I established this uh, Biomedical Imaging Research Institute, uh, in part is inspired by Zahi's uh, 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 work here, and, and really a successful uh, group uh, in imaging, translational uh, imaging. So as uh, Phil mentioned, we have a chance now to start to collaborate on MRPAD and really look forward to a lot to more to come in the future. So our focus on coronary MR imaging, both uh, angiography and vessel wall imaging, but I'll start by briefly making some comments about cardiac imaging in general. And we've been talking about it for many years, one-stop shop cardiac imaging, uh, offer a lot of things MRI can do um, function, anatomy, um, flow, and, and, uh, and uh, tissue characterization, but so far has not been happening. So what is the reason? One is uh, it's just too complicated. There are many procedure, time-consuming techniques are, uh, requires a lot of training and a lot of uh, parameter changes, protocol setup. And also, as uh, Mark really gave a fantastic talk this morning, uh, Dr. Griswold, and really point out that uh, the quantification is the key. And I think, uh, I think that uh, currently it's all eyeballing for the clinical diagnosis. It's just very difficult uh, for clinicians. So I think, I mean, just make some brief comment that the quantification is key for, uh, for MRI to be a, a clinical tool uh, in, in cardiac imaging. And uh, we have to make it a push button to make everything simple and quick. Uh, and also, uh, we should emphasize tissue characterization and biomarker imaging is really the major advantage of MRI versus uh, CT, which now can claim can do everything that MRI can do except perhaps tissue characterization and, and biomarkers. So again, before I, I get into uh, coronary imaging, I want to briefly uh, talk about some of the recent development in uh, other uh, aspects of cardiac imaging in our group and, and others. And one area I think is very, uh, very exciting is this diffusion tensor imaging in the heart, which has uh, been used a lot in, in the brain and, and uh, in the heart is really uh, very challenging. Uh, but there are a lot of progress being made and, and we are also working on this in the last few years. And this is uh, some image for uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging in the uh, 3T clinical scanner. And most of the studies so far have been uh, on small animal and, and high field, but this is a clinical scanner 3T. Now I, I can uh, tell you that the, the images are, are quite robust and uh, we can use this uh, different um, um, B value and then calculate the, uh, the, the myocardial fiber uh, structure and look at the helical angle across the, um, the myocardium. And we have been using this in the, in the uh, stem cell uh, imaging to evaluate the stem cell therapy, effectiveness of the stem cell therapy, and to see that in this uh, uh, treated uh, uh, group that you can see that this helical angle across 
the, the myocardium is maintained uh, at least after uh, a few, uh, few weeks. But if you don't have the treatment, then you can see that this angle is becoming flat. It's meaning that the, uh, the, the myocardium is less effective when you have a flat uh, angle. So I think one of the criticisms for uh, cardiac uh, or even brain uh, uh, fiber uh, imaging is lack of validation. So this is a new uh, technique that uh, we've been collaborating with uh, in uh, South Korea. Uh, really look at the, using this uh, optical imaging technique, it's called clarity, to wash out all the lipids of the, uh, the myocardium and then using the optical uh, scan to really look at the fine structures of, of the myocardium. This is the first, first time we can really see all this kind of in, 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 in intact tissue, not in, in pathology cut all the pieces. So then you can do some process and you can really see the, all the, the, the fiber structures. Um, and then we use the DTI to really do a, a true validation. This is not quantitative yet, we're just getting started, but you can see um, roughly that the, uh, the directions are pretty kind of uh, in, uh, pretty much in agreement. So this is a really great start to uh, we want to continue then to make a true validation of this. So one thing I just added in the last minute that, that Zahi mentioned about this FFR, as you know CT has been very hot uh, using uh, CT to do FFR measurement and I think there's uh, also a potential for MRI to do this because we have the true flow information from the coronary. So we can use a uh, neighbor Stokes equation and calculate the, the gradient, uh, pressure gradient across the stenosis, and we can truly uh, uh, calculate the, the FFR. This is some early attempt that uh, we're doing here, and uh, it's, it's just basic 2D, uh, uh, actually 3D uh, flow uh, uh, technique uh, to look at the coronary and, and temporal and spatial dilution had to be very high, so this takes a long time uh, at this time, it's about 15 minutes to do one, one uh, acquisition. So we did uh, test this on some patients, and I think, and so far, if you look at some of the uh, um, really high uh, degree stenosis, uh, obviously this is easy uh, population, you do see that uh, FFR drop as compared to uh, invasive FFR. This is uh, a few patients we did, and you can see that uh, with the patients, uh, you do have this um, higher uh, pressure gradient across the uh, segment of the coronary artery and, and you, when you're healthy, a subject you don't have. So this, at least you can see qualitatively, there's some difference in this pressure drop across segment of coronary arteries. And we did a, a, a couple of patients so far that have, it's very actually difficult to have a, a real patient that have a invasive FR have a, a significant drop. So these patients have uh, a drop, very significant drop in, in the invasive FFR. So we did find out from the MRI uh, FFR estimate, you, you also have a significant drop. But it's not one to one. There's had to be a different ratio, uh, a threshold uh, for if we indeed have to, to do this uh, using MRI. So you have to have a lot of the population find out what the true threshold is. But at least you can see there is a significant drop. Another area that we are working on is this cardiac excess imaging, is a chemical exchange uh, saturation transfer imaging, which uh, can uh, detect uh, a lot of different protein concentration and pH, uh, so uh, have the potential to do metabolic imaging. So this is some early results in the uh, animal model uh, with the chronic MI. Uh, the goal is here is to look at the creatine concentration, and this is, again, some early, uh, early work that uh, we can we're not just use this as, a, as a, another way to do LGE imaging, it's just more to use LGE uh, to validate the, the area that is, I mean, it's not exactly, but it's still, it's pretty, um, uh, pretty similar, I would say. So now let's move into uh, coronary imaging. As you know, we have to deal with motion. That's a major challenge and cardiac motion. Uh, currently, we still have to use this ECG uh, trigger and to do a lot of op I mean, preparation before the acquisition, and uh, this is pretty much the standard way. And with the uh, respiratory motion and, and navigator echo is still the, uh, the clinically used method. There's lots of new stuff coming up, as I will uh, talk about, but uh, currently all the clinical studies are still done with the navigator. 
So uh, anomalous coronary has been uh, the standard. I mean, MRI is really the, 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 the gold standard now for, for look at anomalous uh, origin or this uh, aneurysm in the coronary arteries. It's uh, very easy to look at the, the, uh, the, the course of the coronary artery and the, the, the big uh, uh, dilation of the lumen. So these are easy thing to do, but MRI has been really very really effective. In terms of native coronary stenosis, uh, there have been multi-center uh, studies. There are several studies in over the years, the last 15 years, and all using navigator and 3D uh, acquisition. You can see that over the years, and this is the last one, is what we have done in the last few years, and, and we're still writing up the, the paper, a lot of analysis that is going on. So there's, uh, you can see that uh, this is a 3D. The last one is 3D uh, contrast enhanced imaging. The other two is a true FESP, uh, steady state free precession uh, imaging with uh, 1.5T. So you can see that the sensitivity are more or less the same over the years, and so you're not really doing much better. And, but the specificity does inc did increase uh, quite a bit over the years. So that really, uh, because of the Im improved image quality and contrast, that we can really make it more specific. Here are some some kind of examples of images. This is Dr. Sakuma's study from Japan. This is a multi-center trial in, in, uh, in, in Japan. You can see one example here uh, compared with the conventional angiography. And this is the, the study we published a few years ago uh, uh, on this uh, 3D contrast enhanced uh, flash uh, acquisition um, in China. So nowadays, there's a, a lot of development uh, in our group and many others that I'm not going to give too many of those uh, discussions, but uh, the self-gating is the way to go because you do not require this uh, setup of the navigator, it takes some time. And also, navigator is not a direct measure of the cardiac motion, it's an indirect measure, and uh, it's also interrupt the, the acquisition mode of uh, continuous acquisition. So, so now self-gating is the way to go, the self-gating is uh, basically acquire the motion information from the image itself and without uh, additional setup to collect the navigator. So we're doing this uh, continuous acquisition uh, uh, and, and you can get this uh, both uh, the respiratory motion and cardiac motion uh, detected from the self-gating profile by doing uh, some kind of filtering and use this information to do retrospective uh, motion correction and end gating. So this is kind of uh, uh, a very crowded slide, but it's really just more of uh, tell you that we can uh, uh, basically separate the, the data from during the cardiac, uh, the retrograde phase and also cardiac phase, and then you combine the images uh, by doing motion correction. So again, this is some of the recent work that uh, by uh, Jianning Pang, who has just joined Siemens in Chicago this month, and uh, basically, we can also do cardiac motion correction and really to expand the, uh, the uh, window of, of acquisition uh, during the cardiac cycle, which will increase the efficiency to make the scan time much shorter. Here are some examples of without ECG, without uh, breath hold, obviously without navigator, and some uh, kind of images from different angle and, and different uh, uh, cardiac uh, phase. You can see the coronaries uh, in, in different uh, location here. This is isotropic resolution, uh, about uh, 10 minutes of scan. So again, you can do 3D volume rendering and, and look at the, the whole data set in a 3D mode. Uh, uh, again, it's the, the quality of the image is, uh, is always dependent on the, a little bit dependent on the, on the cardiac um, um, motion and if, if you have Sicily, then the image obviously is not going to be very good. But Dasley, you tend to, be have, uh, tend to have a better image quality. And I think this is, I think the goal of, uh, of our work is to make it the push button without setting up ECD, without setting up the navigator, without setting up the image orientation is a straight uh, 3D volume and, and uh, I think make it things much easier. You can also get cardiac function information from this. And this is the work from NYU and in collaboration with, uh, uh, with Lausanne, uh, Matthias Stuber, and they do one step further, and this is called 5D imaging. It's look at also uh, not just the cardiac motion result, but also uh, respiratory motion result. So 
Uh, again, this is a really a great uh, way of doing coronary imaging in the future. So now I think you can do coronary imaging, but uh, in the end, uh, a lot of this uh, cardi myocardial infarction is not caused by the degree of stenosis, but more caused by this uh, uh, plaque rupture that uh, uh, with a very small, relatively small coronary stenosis. So, so it's very important to look at the vessel wall. And there are a lot of biomarkers and a lot of different uh, uh, definitions of vulnerable, so-called vulnerable plaque. And I think uh, I'm, this is really uh, uh, the place that started all the coronary imaging stuff that uh, Zahi has done some pioneer work in this area. So I'm not going to talk too much into this biology, but I just want to mention that we want to focus on three areas of uh, work. Uh, look at coronary plaque calculation. One is the inflammation, one is the, the hemorrhage, and the other is the, obviously the positive remodeling. All these are kind of low-hanging fruits that with the current technology, we can uh, do a decent job. A lot of technical challenges with the coronary uh, wall imaging, which is even more challenging than the MRA. Uh, I mean, look at the contrast is the main, main issue, uh, and obviously you want to have higher dilution as well. So I'll just go over a few areas of, uh, of imaging that we can do today. And uh, obviously 3D as a chalk resolution is ideal. Uh, which uh, is currently uh, been done in carotid and in aorta and peripheral uh, artery. I hope that this is something we will show for the coronaries like this. But again, this is something that uh, 15 years ago, Zahi published this uh, really uh, um, uh, landmark work that uh, got people inspired to, to do this. And this is uh, some uh, basic 2D TSE stuff, but you can really see uh, some really great images you see this uh, normal lumen, but uh, with a mild uh, thickening of the, of the coronary wall. And this is some work when I was in Chicago. We had a, uh, a two center with uh, Johns Hopkins, David Blumke, uh, on this uh, uh, detection of the positive remodeling in uh, a high risk but asymptomatic uh, population. This is a part of the MESA trial that uh, we added on. So you can see there is, a, uh, again, normal lumen, but uh, eccentric uh, wall thickening in this uh, area. And this is the work by, John, uh, by Stanford and showing that in type two diabetes, you see, uh, you see a, a kind of a concentric uh, wall thickening uh, as well, and, and you can very clearly uh, see that. Obviously, this is uh, the future. We want to do 3D, but it's very challenging. It's, uh, you may get this kind of image in one out of 10 uh, patients. So, so it's not readily available. There are a lot of techniques developed, but it's not very robust and, and consistent. So we require a lot of more work. So it's may, maybe easier to do the next is uh, look at the plaque composition and particularly lipid core and hemorrhage and because they have, um, um, they have uh, a short T1. So we can do a simple uh, T1-weighted scan uh, to, to look at those uh, biomarkers. So hemorrhage is, uh, can be caused by, uh, there is a rupture of the fibrous cap and blood uh, getting into the, the plaque, or due to uh, uh, immature uh, neo vessels and leaky vessels so that, that blood, blood uh, red blood cell come out of the, the blood vessel. So, and it's very prevalent in the, in the carotid, but in the coronaries it's less. But still, I think this is a landmark work by uh, Womani's group, um, uh, many years ago, and sh showing this is autopsy analysis, uh, patient caused, uh, caused by, by this uh, coronary uh, uh, disease, and they found out in the late stage uh, necrosis, almost half have hemorrhage, but in the large core with a thin cap, which is the most risky of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the plaque, and 77% have hemorrhage. So there's indeed, even in the coronaries, have a lot of hemorrhage in late stage uh, uh, um, plaques. And also they showed in rabbit studies that, that uh, hemorrhage can stimulate um, other uh, component of the, uh, the plaque, for example, the macro, uh, macrophage and also higher lipid content. So, so this uh, IPH is uh, it's a very important biomarker uh, for a vulnerable plaque. And, and they tend to have a higher, a shorter T1, so they have a higher uh, signal in the T1-beta scan. So within kind of acute and subacute stage, they tend to have a, a short T1. So this is 
kind of work that we, uh, we did for Crotted, and we want to make this something called hotspot imaging. We want to make everything dark uh, in one image, particular image, and, and only the hemorrhage will, will appear uh, bright, and this is here. And we do have this uh, other images uh, interleaved uh, with the core attribution and to give you the basic anatomical information. Uh, then you can uh, merge them together to, to give you a complete uh, understanding of the, uh, the hotspot. And this is all, all been done also in the, in the coronaries. And this is uh, work by, uh, uh, by a group in Japan and, and showing that uh, in the coronaries, if you do a T1 beta scan, you can see some hotspots here and uh, has some correlation with the uh, low density uh, CT uh, image. And also they did uh, uh, ultrasound and show a good correlation with this so-called high intensity uh, plaque is, have, is associated with lipid uh, rich core and, and, and hemorrhage. So the group of uh, Noguchi in Japan, they did uh, another study uh, two years ago. And this is a, uh, really a follow up of patients all patients have uh, proven CAD, either infraction or, or significant coronary uh, stenosis, and uh, then follow up for uh, up to six years, and they find out that if you have this uh, uh, high intensity plaque, they tend to die, uh, have more events, uh, much more than those who do not have this high intensity plaque. So this is really give us uh, really a great uh, prognostic tool. And then this is a the work they published the last year and, and showing that if you have statin treatment and this so-called PMR is a, a plaque um, myocardial uh, uh, tissue uh, signal ratio. So this is kind of used as a, as a normalization to, to um, uh, provide the comparison between different subjects. And if you look at this, uh, this uh, PMI has uh, 1.68 and uh, after a year, after statin treatment, you see that this is uh, reduced. So you can see that there uh, can also evaluate the, the uh, effectiveness of the treatment with this uh, technique. Lastly is, uh, is inflammation. As you all know, inflammation is, uh, is a key uh, player in, the, in this, uh, both the origin and the origination and also progression of, uh, of plaques. So um, this been, uh, imaging of, of inflammation has been done in carotid with a delay, delayed uh, enhancement. Uh, and also you can quantify the uh, curve and, and calculate the K-trend. K -trend. So uh, this can be done in also other places, in intracranial vessel wall imaging. This is work by Dr. Chi Yang, and we are working together. And this is from um, Beijing Xianwu Hospital. You can see that intracranial, also you can see this uh, enhancement here, and which um, uh, has a close uh, association with the, with the stroke in these patients. And uh, this is the work by Rene Butner in, in, in London. And then they did the imaging with the uh, um, patient have MI, recent MI. They can also show that there is an enhancement here as compared to a normal control uh, population. You don't see this enhancement. So this is about 20, 30 minutes after the contrast uh, injection. So all this hotspot imaging is very promising, but technically they're quite challenging. And you have to collect separate MRA and plaque imaging scans, and, and you may not have complete registration. And also the total scan time is um, usually more than 30 minutes. Uh, resolution and coverage are all limited. So, so we did this um, uh, improvement in, in, in this uh, MR technique to, um, to do the co-registered interleaved t one beta dark blood and bright blood imaging. And this with the 3D radio sampling, uh, with a total scan time of 10 minutes, uh, isotropic resolution, and, and we also uh, did a comparison with the OCT um, for tissue characterization. This is a basic uh, sequence diagram. We have two interleaved uh, cardiac cycles. The first one is after the IR preparation. The first gave you the dark blood image only uh, kind of have uh, really uh, highlight the, the inflammation for pre-contrast or I mean the hybrid in pre-contrast and inflammation post-contrast. And the second uh, acquisition is really gave you a, a so-called may, maybe gray blood, not really uh, bright blood, but uh, give you some uh, background uh, MRA uh, information to tell you where 
uh, this uh, hotspot is in, in the coronary artery tree. So this is the motion correction scheme I mentioned uh, previously. Um, basically, it really improves the imaging efficiency and, and reduces scan time uh, by doing post-processing of uh, uh, motion correction. So here are some examples of this uh, uh, um, we call CHIP. It's a, a high-intensity, uh, coronary high-intensity plaque. And this is a pre-contrast, and you can see this uh, uh, movie of, of the image across different uh, slices. You can see here there's a bright uh, spot here. And, uh, and this is uh, CTA, and so there's a significant stenosis, and, uh, and this is uh, angiography and OCT. And this is a cross-section of that, that image, and you see this uh, um, highlighted area of red is really the very enhanced. And this is, again, the same image I just showed, a static uh, frame that you saw that there is a, this uh, green blood really gave you this anatomical uh, background marker that tells you that this is indeed in here. And again, they're completely registered, so you don't have the issue of, of uh, two separate scans. So this is a post-contrast chip, and, and again, this is uh, this, uh, the second scan gave you this MR angiography information. This is a, the black blood first scan gave you this uh, hot spot, and, and you put them together. And, and this is a cross-section of that, and this is CTA and, uh, and NGU. So we did about 30 some patients and compared uh, with some of the uh, OCT uh, classification of the plaques. And you can see the pre-contrast uh, image shows a very good correlation with uh, lipid and macrophages and uh, cholesterol level. So, and the post-contrast show a, a close correlation with the macrophages and microvessels. So those are kind of inflammation uh, markers uh, that, that that we think that we're doing, we're imaging uh, with the post-contrast MRI uh, imaging. So then you, we did a, a, I mean, total OCT score and, and this uh, so-called PMI uh, um, uh, numbers, and you see a reasonable correlation and for both pre- and post-contrast imaging, and then we put them all together, both pre- and post, and you can see an incre increased, slightly increased uh, correlation as well. And as Mark mentioned in the morning, it's all about numbers. So we have to eventually get the numbers. And so one thing is we want to do dynamic uh, contrast enhanced imaging uh, for post, uh, uh, post contrast. And so we can calculate, like, like we did in the, in, in the carotid, we can also do this key trends uh, calculation in the, but it's still very challenging. We're just getting started. So it's going to take some time. So um, we also, as, uh, again, we want to be quantitative. So you want, this is the goal we want to do. We want to do really T1 mapping for uh, coronary plaque imaging. So this is some early work. It's not in the coronary yet, but this is something that uh, we're moving towards coronaries, and we want to do non-ECG continuous acquisition T1 mapping. This is some new scheme that uh, one of my postdoc, Chris, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Anthony is doing, and, and really to do a continuous acquisition to uh, resolve the cardiac and retinal motion and still get the T1 mapping. So the take home message is that um, uh, coronary plaque burden measurement is still uh, challenging. So that, I mean, there's a lot of work uh, need to be done to, to make this happen. And 3D hotspot imaging uh, is, a, I think, a low hung fruit that can be done today. And it's relatively fast and, and it's uh, quite simple to, to do. Uh, we can detect potentially, we need, still need validation, but the hemorrhage and inflammation, these are major features of vulnerable plaques. And the good thing about this is that it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a more or less a binary detection, so you don't uh, require uh, really a, a perfect image quality. That's what MR angiography is not, is really requiring, so that's why it's, it's very difficult in, in, in multicenter trials. But this one is really can, uh, uh, kind of uh, be tolerable to some type of image quality, I mean, uh, uh, image artifacts. So this is, I think, uh, may have a better uh, potential than MRA. So 
what is the potential significance of doing all this uh, plug imaging in the coroners? And, and obviously, can potentially do individualized risk stratification and also serve as a surrogate marker for uh, uh, clinical trials, for example, evaluating therapeutic response. The whole uh, area for molecular imaging is, uh, I'm not going to touch, and this is what Zahi does uh, in here, and, and I think he's really the leader in many different fronts. A lot of markers here, and, and I'm, again, I'm not going to touch uh, on this. Finally, PET uh, MR is uh, something, as Phil mentioned, we're starting to collaborate on this uh, to uh, use the sodium fluoride imaging to look at micro uh, calcification together with uh, uh, coronary uh, uh, plaque imaging with MRI. So this is uh, very exciting and, and I hope that we will um, continue to make some progress. This is the first uh, study that uh, we did in uh, Cedar sinai Actually, this is uh, mostly for evaluating uh, aortic uh, stenosis, but um, you can also see uh, uh, some um, uh, left main uh, uptake as well. So in the end, I want to uh, cite this uh, some statement by uh, Dr. Uh, Fuster in, in the recent Jack comments and saying that we should not, we should not just look at individual uh, coronary to look at their features, but we should look at the entire uh, um, plaque burden. This is, again, requires really advanced technology to cover the entire coronary artery tree and even the whole body of the uh, coronary plaques. And, and uh, obviously this requires a lot of work and something this, if we can do this in all patients, then, then we're really in, in business. So uh, thank you all and, and I would thank, like to thank the, the team in Cedar sinai and many collaborators including Zahi and, and Phil here and Siemens and, and NIH support. Thank you for your attention. very much that wonderful talk. Uh, any questions? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the stand is, uh, um, the safety issue I mean, is, is another story, but I mean, look at the image artifacts. Um, if you have, um, obviously if you're right there at the stand area, it's hard to, to see anything, but in terms of causing signal drop in the nearby area, that there's, obviously can cause RF distortion and all the image distortion, but um, this is the area we're looking into. There's something called broadband uh, uh, kind of excitation or inversion uh, preparation can uh, somewhat um, minimize that artifact. So it can limit the artifact in, in that stand only, not extend to too much of the area. That's been done in the uh, group in UCLA, uh, Peng Hu. He's doing that for delayed enhancement. I think that's something we are thinking to implement here to really limit the, the damage uh, that um, we can see other areas well. I think that's, it's definitely possible. Debbie, it's just great as always. Thank you. We talked a little bit about this at lunch, but I'm wondering if you can maybe talk about it some more. How much of the, the problem in getting those beautiful coronaries is stuff that doesn't really have anything to do with the physics or the acquisition. How much of it is the way we set up the patient, like the e EKG gating and the yeah. breath holding, and how much of it is stuff that we can control in the magnet? What do you think the balance is right now? Yeah, I, I think that's why it's been difficult to uh, extend this technology to uh, many centers. It does require a lot of preparation on both the operator side and the patient side. I mean, on the operator side, you have to have a tech that is really committed to it, to really want to do a good job and to really take time to, for example, the navigator is still the current standard, how to set up the navigator to be I mean, in a good position and, and that itself is a, is a challenge. That's why we want to get rid of it. Secondly, the, the trigger delay time is a challenge. You have to make sure that the time is, you have to do the CINI and make sure that the, the window duration and the delay is proper. And, um, and also you have to change sometimes to change the, the number of uh, segments per cardiac cycle and that's, mm -hmm. you have to make a decision on that. So uh, on the patient side, and uh, obviously ECD had to be good and, and uh, the breathing pattern had to be somewhat uh, more regular and we found out if you do a kind of a 
both that, that help to make the breathing a little bit more um, regular. And I think that helps and you have to make patient to be alert during the scan and, and make sure they don't fall into sleep and, and start to, to breathe suddenly. So many little things like this and you, you need someone that really can uh, um, follow up on the protocol and, and make sure everything is done right. And this is just very difficult and I understand that, yeah. Do you have any, any early ideas from these self-gated methods? Do they make that better or is it just another set of problems? At least it's not, uh, I mean, the navigator is, is gone. So that takes about 10 minutes or so because you have to look at the, the center and to test it, test it as you, you, you know that. So, but uh, so far there have not been too many uh, clinical experiences yet in, with the self-gating uh, approach. We have done something in, uh, in China. I mean, just have a paper uh, just been accepted in radiology. Um, and the results are still, I mean, not as good as what I was expecting. Maybe there's still issues because if there's still some kind of motion detection uh, in the, the self-gating. Still a little bit of uh, somewhat, it's all in the recon, it's not on the, uh, in real time, but the recon side, you still have to determine some of the uh, area of, uh, you want to use for motion detection. You have to set up this hard uh, field of view. And also, um, there's, I think the motion, the accuracy of the motion detection for self grading is still somewhat limited because your background can interfere with the, the, the motion of the heart. So it's not a kind of done deal yet. I, I don't think so. Uh, but it's at least solve one problem, maybe create another problem. But yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, maybe I can ask uh, just, just one more at the end. Um, what, what are your thoughts on taking some of this stuff to 7 Tesla? Uh, it seems like the, uh, with the, the chip, um, the gray blood would be even, mm -hmm. even brighter blood, MRI mm -hmm. under that, with the higher signal to noise there. And as well with some of the, the extra stuff, like the CES you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think people have done some 7T uh, with the basic coronary MRI. But with this T1 weighted, you need to have a good inversion uh, pulse. That could be a challenge. Um, I don't know yet, but uh, um, you have to use, I mean, really f sophisticated uh, our pulse to do a good job with, uh, with the inversion pulse. Other than that, you have to use uh, a small flip angle gradient uh, uh, echo pulse. I mean, it could be okay. Uh, I think just the inversion pulse I'm, I'm concerned about, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we'll just have this nice token of our appreciation for you. Right. So thanks very much for coming and giving a talk today. Thank so you. Thank you very much.